How you guys doing? Good to be here. My name is Kevin Ha. I am the lead pastor at a church called New City Church of Los Angeles. It's walking distance from here as Spring and Fifth, right across the street from Alexandria. We want to welcome you to join us. We got lots of people from Skid Row, lots of people from the Lops, and we come together to worship. God is doing something special. It's a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multicultural, multi-socioeconomic, all kinds of people coming together to worship the Lord together. So I want to invite you to come. Our worship services are at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Become a part of our community. It was part of the vision of Love LA here to start this uh, ministry. And I see, uh, I see some people who come to New City here, and it's good to see you all. And um, what I'm going to do today is uh, I, I'm going to kick off a series. I come on the fourth Sunday of each month. So I come here every month. So every time I come, I'm going to continue a series uh, that I'm preaching through right now at New City Church. But we're preaching through Revelation. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick some of the better sermons, all right? So you get the better of all the sermons that's preached uh, and, and preach it to you here. And uh, if you wanted to pick up the other parts of Revelation that I'm not preaching on, uh, you can go to our website. If you have access to a computer, you can, you can go to New City, New City Church and, and go to the sermon section. All the sermons that we're preaching through and the book of Revelation uh, are there. I know a lot of people want to learn about Revelation and not a lot of pastors teach it. And, um, and so hopefully uh, this will be helpful to you. So uh, today I want to teach from not the text that is written in your bulletin. I changed my mind. All right. So I'm going to be teaching. I, I'm going to be preaching a sermon that's a little bit more provocative uh, than the one that I was going to preach to you. So the title of the sermon today is "Sex, Money, and Zezebel." All right. That, that's like you got to listen to this one, right? Sex, money, and Zezebel. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to preach from Revelation chapter two, verse eighteen to twenty-nine. Now, what's going on here is that Jesus. There is a vision of the glorified, resurrected, ascended Jesus that John has a vision of, right? And, and this Jesus is giving messages to the seven churches of Asia. So Asia at that time was basically Turkey, uh, modern day Turkey. And so this is, uh, uh, this particular letter that we're going to talk about is to a letter to the church in Theratia, okay, it's, it comes from Revelations chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 to 29, and so uh, you don't have it in your bulletin, if you have your Bible with you, you can open it with me, but if you don't have your Bible with you, you can just listen real carefully, all right? Revelation 2, verse 18, to the angel of the church in Theratia, right? These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Zezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on the bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead, 
Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with the iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will give, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This sounds pretty rough, right? I mean, at first re reading, it doesn't feel very relevant to us. But as you might be able to tell from the title of the sermon, this, you will see that this, this is extremely relevant to us. So, you know, in order to understand the book of Revelation, you can't just read it. You have to understand how the people of that time understood it, okay? So you have to understand the context that it's written to. So the city of Theratia is one of the smallest smaller cities of Asia Minor where all the seven churches are located. Seven churches are the churches that Jesus wrote letters to in the book of Revelation. This city still exists. Theratia still exists. It's now called Akisar and, and it's, in, it's in Turkey right now. Now this city, uh, from archaeological evidence, this is what we know about this city uh, at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, which is probably written about AD 96 or something like that. This city is famous, was famous for having trade guilds. Okay, that's like uh, trade unions, kind of. Archaeologists have found evidence of a lot of different kinds of trade guilds that come together not only for business, but also for worship and pleasure. So they found trade guilds related to uh, wool, leather, linen, bronze smiths, shoemakers, bakers, rope makers, purple dye makers. Uh, remember, I don't know if you remember, but Lydia, the dealer in purple linen who first became a convert in Philippi, she's actually from Theratia. We know that from the book of Acts. In fact, purple dye is famous in this area. They still make those purple dye, and they now call it Turkish red. It, it seems that almost all trades were organized into a guild here. The problem was that these, these guilds were not religiously neutral. These guilds had patron deities. These guild members were expected to worship, offer sacrifices, and eat meat sacrificed to these pagan idols and engage in sexual activities as part of the fellowship of the guild. That's the way the world was at the time for these people. And so Christians face a dilemma if you're a Christian in this area. If you didn't if you didn't join a guild and go with the flow of what everybody else did, it was impossible to climb the social and economic ladder. Right? So that's the context of the letter to Theratia. And what did Jesus say to this church? Jesus first said, I know your deeds, your love and your faith and your service and your perseverance and that you are now doing more than what you did at first. These are awesome commendations. It means that there were a lot of faithful people in this church. Yet, Jesus also chastised them. He said, you can't... You cannot tolerate idolatry in the name of love, he says. He, Jesus says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Zezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating of food sacrificed to idols. Now, 
We don't know for sure if this was literally a woman, but the revelations tend to do that, use symbolic, poetic language. We don't know if this was literally a woman, but Jesus referred to this person as a Zezebel, a woman. The story of Zezebel is in the Old Testament. She was this evil and manipulative woman who married Ahab, the king of Israel, and led a quest to get Israel to worship Baal. Uh, Baal was this storm and fertility god. And so although she knew that Israelites believed in only one god, Yahweh, her strategy was to get people to worship both Baal and Yahweh. And if people spoke against Baal worship, she had them killed. While the people of Israel were under the influence and deception of Zezebel, Elijah was the prophet at that time. And this is what Elijah said. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Now a person Jesus called Zezebel was at work in the church of Theratia advocating this both and approach to God. So she was essentially saying you can participate in the guilds and their pagan activities and follow Jesus. You can eat food sacrificed to idols and follow Jesus. And, and by the way, I know some of you are thinking, wait a second, then Paul said it's okay to eat food sacrificed to idols? You have to interpret this in the context of what's going on in Theratia. Paul was most likely talking about food sacrificed to idols and then later sold at a meat market. But given the context of the meals at the guild meeting in Theratia, it is participating in the sacrifices. You know, so if somebody else sacrificed food and to an idol and then sold it in the meat market, do what your conscience tells you to do. But if this means going and participating in the sacrifice, in the guilt yeah, we cannot do as followers of Jesus Christ. The church in Theratia faced a real dilemma, a real issue. Zezebel spoke as one with authority because she was called a prophet. The text says she spoke of deep secrets that sway people. No one is exactly sure what this deep secret refers to, but whatever it is, it led people to participate in idol sacrifices and sexual immorality because this teaching was tolerated. It probably means that it sort of sounded Christian. It sort of sounded okay. You could participate in it, you know, sort of like quote, you can participate in, paid in the economic pagan life of the community and follow Jesus at the same time. Why, did, why make this a big issue, she might have said. Would God really want you to lose your guild membership and lose your trade and become poor, she might have said. Don't, doesn't he love you, she might, she might have said. Did God really want you, not tell you not to associate with all those pagans? Did he tell you to love them? How would that help the mission of God? I don't know. Whatever she might have said, it sounded kind of Christian. And Zezebel was deceptively, deceptively getting people to participate in idol worship and activities. But in a way that sounded kind of Christian. Okay? The Bible is clear. God commands us to worship Him and Him only. The first two of the Ten Commandments are against idolatry. Idol idols are not just stone gods. They are anything we put equal or ahead of God. Yet, it is really difficult even in modern life to do this. The teaching of Zezebel is very tempting. We're constantly looking for a way to serve both idols and God. See, in this context, they participated in an idol worship related to money and sex. And, and I think these are the two of the biggest idols of our time. So I want to focus on these two idols and talk about them a little bit. First, let's talk about the idolatry of money. Jesus told us 
in Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 that no one, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the others or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, in what ways do you and I make idols of money? I'm going to give you two ways in which we do that. One, by compartmentalizing our spiritual life and our financial life. I mean, I, I hear this all the time from people. I regularly hear people say, look, I'm all for loyalty to Jesus, but things just don't work out that way in a real world, Pastor. Business is business, they say. Now, you might not be saying this out loud, but you're thinking it and you're practicing it. I know it's hard. I've been there. It's, it's so easy to compartmentalize our spiritual life and our financial life. One way on Sunday and another on Monday. You're essentially serving two different gods. We do this because it's so hard to keep our loyalty to God in our financial life. See, this is not just a matter of morality. It is a matter of who you worship. Are you worshiping God only or are you worshiping God and money? I know ethical issues come up all the time in the workplace. There is the temptation to lie. You know, when you're late or when you're missing work, you can, you can only use my granddaddy died excuse so many times. After a while, you kind of lose track of how many granddaddies you got. You know, I, I don't know if you know what I mean, but I've done that. So, uh, you, 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 you don't even know what truth is anymore after a while. And there are also temptations to, to misrepresent yourself and, and job obligations because you want to get that job so much. And I understand that. There are temptations to lie in interviews. There are temptations to lie in your application for housing or SSI or government assistance or, or in your taxes or whatever it is. There are so many temptations to misrepresent. And for some of you, you're in a line of work that don't do any common good. Maybe a certain kind of you know, entertainment in which it's abusive or exploitative or you're selling stuff that harms people. Maybe you're exploiting people who are ignorant to make money. I know you think this is the only way you're going to make money, the only way you can survive, but here's the thing. That's what Jezebel taught. That's what Jezebel said. You don't have to drop out of the trade guild. You can serve both God and money. You can compartmentalize your life. That's what she's saying and that's what you're doing. Trust God. To trust God means to make the right decision and allow God to guide you. God is not out there to make you suffer. The reality is that the greater suffering is for those who serve money. It may not look like it right now, but when the veil is lifted, there is more suffering for those who follow the ways of Zezebel. Now, second ways, second way in which we make idols of money is by using God to get money. Now, if you use God to get anything, the real God in your life is the thing that you're trying to get. If you're trying, if you're using God to get money, money is your real God. That's your idol. Church is full of Zezebels who teach that God is out there to help you get rich. They, they teach formulas or they teach deep secrets to get rich. It's cloaked in Christianese, but it's often a manipulative way to extract money from people who desperately need money. Can I get an amen to this? Let's cast that out of the church. God is not a genie who's out there to make us reach. I know it's tempting to believe them and I know it's hard when you're living from check to check and GR check to GR check, SSI to SSI. I know how hard it is 
and I know that it, you know how hard it is when you don't have any money you feel like money can solve all your problems yeah you, you think it will help you feel better about this about yourself you feel that if you're if you're somebody you feel like you're somebody if you have some money here's the truth sometimes not having money makes you more prone to the idolatry of money. We have to get to that gutsy attitude that says, even if I remain poor, I'm going to worship God and Him alone. Amen? God is the source of my life and my identity. God is my riches. I am a child of God, loved by God, embraced by God, and that's all that matters. Amen? If I should be blessed with more money, I'm going to use it as a tool to bless people. It's not going to solve all my problems. I'm just going to be a blessing to other people. You see, money is a good thing, but it's not going to solve all our problems. If we think that, we make money into a master, not a servant, not a tool. Money, brothers and sisters, is only a tool. It is a tool to do something good with. I'm not saying that money is not important. It is important. Tools are important. If we don't have a tool, it's hard to get stuff done, right? But it is not our master. It's not our master. There is a point in which we make money our master. You can't, you know, if, if you can't give and share anything you got, that's when you know. That's when you know. If you can't give, if you can't share, if you're just holding on to it too tightly, that's when you know maybe money has become your master. I'm not saying that you are. I know that there are lots of different factors. But if you can't share what you have, Oftentimes, it shows that money has become your master and not your tool. Now, that's the idolatry of money. But let me talk, secondly, about the idolatry of sex, because that's what the two issues were. Idolatry of money and idolatry of sex in this story. So Jezebel taught that it was okay to engage in sexual immorality. In the pagan culture, in Theratia, this culture was very similar to the way our culture is right now. Engaging in casual sex was considered a normal part of the cultural and religious life. So, of course, the culture only allowed that for men. If you were a woman, it wasn't okay to engage in sexual activities outside of marriage. You know, from that context, Apostle Paul taught husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. This was a pretty radical teaching at the time. And from that culture, Apostle taught people to avoid sexual immorality, which is sex outside of marriage. Hey, this is such a, a mistaken arena of Christianity. Here's one mistaken view of sex. Some people think that somehow sex is dirty, and, and if, you, if we really want to be spiritual, we should avoid sex altogether. I mean, and that's not true. That's not the biblical teaching about sex. That line of reasoning actually uh, originated with Greek philosopher Plato, who believed that anything that is material, like anything that you can touch and feel, uh, any body, anything that is related to that is bad, and anything immaterial, anything spiritual was good. And so that, that's called dualism. That's the heresy of Gnosticism. That was a very prevalent heresy in the beginning of the church. That's not Christianity. In Christianity, God, the Spirit, the material became material became a human being a material being you see there is no dualism between spiritual thing and a physical thing in Christianity sex does so so there's no division between beautiful spiritual thing and dirty sexing that is not a Christian thinking sex is a beautiful thing. You heard it here, brothers and sisters. Sex here, sex is a beautiful thing. God's not up there. He's not up there saying, my, my, what would they think of next? No, he's not up there saying that God is the one who invented sex. And if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, chapter 7, verse 5, Bible actually commands us to have sex. Would, would God command us to do something that is dirty? No, no, no. Sex is a beautiful thing when designed 
when done in a context that it's designed to be done in. Okay? But there's also this opposite mistake about sex. Some people just say sex is just an instinct. So just as when we are hungry, we need to eat, we should have sex when we're horny. Yeah? But the scripture tells us that our biological, natural instinct and desire is messed up because of sin. Just because we feel like getting a fix doesn't mean we should get one, right? And just because we feel an urge to eat doesn't mean we should eat anything indiscriminately. We better make sure we're eating good food. We're, we're not eating bad food or ruined food or rotten food, right? And just because, so just because we're hungry doesn't mean we should just indiscriminately eat. Eve. Now, just because we're horny just doesn't mean we should engage in sex indiscriminately. We're called to do it in a context that God designed it. Now, let's think about that a little bit. Now, why? Did you ever think about why God invented sex? Now, I'm thinking, yeah, I know you're thinking, you're thinking, well, you know, procreation. Yeah, I think procreation is a very important, having babies is a very important purpose of sex. But you know, in the Bible, there's actually more to it than that. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31, it says this, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and two will become one flesh, right? You, you heard about this, this one flesh union. You know, this is not just about sex. It's about being one in every way. It's about being one emotionally. It's about being one economically, socially, spiritually, commitment-wise. You're saying, I am one with you and I ain't leaving. There's, there's a sense of commitment and, 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 and physically. You see, the oneness is, a, is part of total oneness. Sex is an act that one, sex is the act of that one flesh union. Sex is a powerful thing in the way God designs it. It actually means something. It's not just a physical urge. It means something. As God designed it, sex is this non-verbal communication to say, we are one. We are one flesh, one organism, one person, spiritually, socially, emotionally, economically, in every way. It seals this one flesh union. It literally does that. It's actually a perfect act for it. So physical union, sex with a person without one flesh union is an act without the meaning. Are you guys getting this? It is a hypocrisy. It's like giving a present with someone without anything in the box. It's empty. It hurts. We know that deep inside of our hearts. We get naked physically without getting naked in any other way. It is very fake. It's not that God doesn't want us to have fun. He says if you, won't, if you don't use it, sex in a way that it's intended to be used, you'll break it. It'll break your heart. It'll break the other person's heart. If you use sex in the way it was designed to be used, it will strengthen your one flesh union. It will strengthen your marriage. Sex is a, commun a commitment tool. Commitment apparatus. It seals your commitment. Only if you use it in a context of total commitment. Now, if we use sex to feel like we are somebody, if we use sex to feel love, if we use sex to feel pleasure, if we use sex to feel powerful, you know, some people, some of us do that, all without the total oneness that comes from an absolute commitment called marriage, we have made sex into an idol. We are worshiping at the feet of the idol called sex. We have been tempted by the spirit of Zezebel that tells us, well, you know, it's okay to engage in sex outside of marriage. And worship God. Now, I know this sounds a little harsh to some of you, and you, some of you are saying, you know, I kind of like the way Zezebel taught, but I think we all have to come face to face with the idols of our lives. See, 
I, I, I want to just spend a few moments into deeper idols that drive our idolatry for money and sex. I, I know for some of you, you might, you know, if I asked you the question, uh, do, you, do you make money into an idol? Do you make sex into an idol? You, you might say, no, no, I, I don't do that. I don't do that. But do you cut corners and lie to make money? Do you engage in sex outside of marriage? And the answer is yes. And maybe, maybe what's going on is that there's actually an idol beneath your idol of money and sex. Maybe what you really idolize is that you want to be somebody. You want to be somebody. And you're thinking to yourself, maybe if you can get that person to bed, maybe then you feel like you're desirable and lovable. And so you desperately want to believe that about yourselves and you see you're trying to get life from something other than God. And here's the deep truth about idolatry. It's ultimately about getting life from something other than God. And that's why God is constantly commanding us, commanding us to worship Him only and have no idols in our life. God is the only source of life. Nothing else gives us life. They're all fake when the veil is lifted and the reality is shown. This is what the parable passage tells us happens when we engage in idolatry. It says this in verse 22, I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the heart and mind and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. And I know when you read this, it sounds really harsh because it is, but it points to a couple of things. When the passage says children, it doesn't mean kids. It means followers of Zezebel, those who engage in idolatry. And death in Revelation means spiritual death. It's not physical death. It means you are separated from God. When, when the Bible talks about punishing people, it's often in the form of allowing people to face the consequences of their sins. And so as we talked about, you know what? Ultimately, this is what he's saying. Idols never pan out. They want more and more, and they never give life. If you get money, success, and recognition, it will not give you life. There's a demonic force in all of these things, and the demon will tell you, and continue to tell you, you're still not good enough. You're still not successful enough. You still don't have enough. You need more. And if you fail, if you fail, it will tell you that you are a loser. You should just go and kill yourself because you're good for nothing. That's what the devil will tell you. That's what the devil will tell you. There is no life in idolatry. But the point of this passage, however, is that it is a call to repent. God is not up there saying, too bad, here's the punishment. Bam! He's not saying that. He says, I have given her time to repent. That's what he said. He says again, after he talks about the consequence of the action, and he says again, unless they repent of her ways. God, believe. God is calling us to repent. And don't just repent of your sinful action. Repent of the sin beneath the sin, the idols of the heart. Repent of seeking life from something other than God. Repent of seeking life from money, recognition, approval, human acceptance, feelings of love, power, machismo, whatever it is. Repent of all of these things. Repent of seeking life from anything other than God. And you know what? I want to just end by this one last point. There is, this whole passage ends with a beautiful promise. Promise. This good news. And Jesus told them this good news that He is coming. He's coming. I love this promise. And then He says, He will give one, give that person a morning star. A morning sign. I love this. In the last chapter of Revelation, Jesus refers to himself as the morning star. See, the morning star usually appears at the darkest time of the night, maybe about two or three in the morning. It usually emerges at a point when the night is as dark as it's going to get. When it appears, there's no sign of the dawn, but when it appears, very faint and small at first, you know that night cannot withstand the dawn. 
It's just a matter of time until the dawn wipes away the night. Amen. And when the morning star appears, we know that morning is coming. We know that kingdom of God is coming. So when Jesus says, I will give you the morning star, he's saying that he, 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 he is saying he will encourage those who are in darkness. Keep our eyes on the morning star, Jesus Christ. And we know that the fullness of the kingdom of God is right behind it. That's where we are that's what it's all about. It's about going and getting light from Jesus in the midst of our darkness. Because He is the morning star. And not getting light from our idols of money, sex, or the teachings of Zezebel. Amen? Amen. Let's go to God in prayer.